welcome to this vast crowd who has come to support our AGM. <laughs> Indeed, members and friends and people who are just beginning training, people who did it a long time ago, and everybody else. Um, and uh, thank you for that wonderful um, workshop that we had to open the day. That helped get the right atmosphere, even if you weren't here. I think the room will still, you will feel good atmosphere. For this. Um, I have some apologies here from, um, this, this, I'm going to try not to. <laughs> Uh, Sue Bulmer, Anne Shearer, um, the Archbishop of Westminster. <laughs> I did, Julie Dent just failed to send her apology. She did last year, but she was probably busy. Lottie Jameson, Richard Davis, Glenn Bonner, Janet Bulmer. Aleka Lutzis, Vicky Hoffman, Alison Coleman, and Jesse Eleanor. And Richard Hoffman. And Richard Hoffman. Okay. Still, we have we have some students from Central School here, which is very nice. Yes. Okay, now Jackie. Oh, there you are, of course, behind the camera. Um, yes, that's right. If you could um, light our traditional candle for um, Sesame International. And if there's anything you want to say about that. There is. <laughs> if you just make this light a little bit. Um, yes, so I'm the international representative of Sesame. And I've had a lovely Irish blessing sent to us by Rafaela from Ireland. She is our permanent representative, and not here today. Um, but uh, she says, um, I would like to include an Irish blessing as the greetings from Ireland, where there are now four active sesame drama therapists. And the blessing is as follows. May the sun shine always on your back, the wind blow gently on your hair, the rain falls softly in your fields, and the Lord hold you in the palm of his hand. Hey and she says, <laughs> she says, I'll be thinking of you and wishing I was there. So for all our members, and they're all over from Asia to South Africa to America, all over the world we've got members. And I'd like to of respect for the stories, the myths that have connected us all and to remind us of Pat. So, um, if I may, to welcome Lord Michael Bates here among us. We had uh, a strange meeting at a wall. Uh, this sounds a bit like the Summer's Night Dream, but it wasn't. <laughs> and just to, to say very briefly, there is a certain wall in London that advertises uh, wonderful causes as traffic goes by. And at the Olympics, we happened to meet at this wall where they were carrying disability and the Olympics 
across three panels of this huge, rather brick wall. And here we were, Becky and I, and we happened to meet this Lord, and we got talking about his peace walk and about the images that he had already in his bag that had taken him through the various places where there was no language of dialogue, but could show grandchildren to people who didn't have an understanding of what was being said, but could identify with the love. And he spoke to us, and Becky and I had a kind of like, oh, I wonder if he'd come and talk to us. So we invited him, and he did. And he's here. And we warmly welcome you to come and talk to us about your, your torch carrying <coughs> and your peace walk, and welcome to us. Thank you so much, and I was captivated also by your work. That's the reason why I came when uh, Becky and Mary told me about it, and it's been great to find more about it uh, today. Uh, and uh, uh, as if uh, talking about unlocking, it's, I always find that, uh, I suppose, on the wall, it, I think this was a conversation that we had at the, uh, at the wall with several drinks in each hand, uh, <laughs> as is the way. And um, <clears throat> that I said that, uh, you know, invariably what I discovered was that people would have a natural reserves about them. Wherever you, I walked through 13 different countries, and, and, and people I found were pretty much exactly the same wherever you uh, went. And, uh, and one of the things would be that they would not necessarily be hostile to you, they'd just be sort of slightly puzzled. You smile at them and they smile back. You know, it's, it's a very sort of relational thing. You know, you ask for directions and they uh, do their best to, to try and uh, help. And, uh, and I did find that one of the ways in which on those many evenings uh, on that walk where I would end up uh, in between places where there was any accommodation and I simply had to try and find a farmhouse or a home, just some, with some lights on, uh, where I might be able to see. And, uh, and the, the thing which I would always do is I would always turn up the, the, the doorstep, as was said, and, um, and I would produce these photographs, you see, and I would sort of say, oh, well, actually, I used to, let's do the full, uh, well, it's not how I turned up. It's first of all, I would show a British passport. <laughs> you know, so they, you know, some complete axe murderer. But, uh, you know, they, they, <laughs> well, I think that that is it. So I'd have my passport, and then I'd say, it's my grandson. Well, of course, they didn't know what I was saying at all, but immediately, you showed a picture, their faces lit up, and say, oh yeah. And, and, and often when I was sort of, you know, looking down from my second one, you know, they were rushing off to get some photographs of their grandchildren as well. And all of a sudden, you then had a slight bit of a relationship, you know, building, just saying, oh, yeah, kind of, you see it. And, and then, of course, we'll be, I said, this is my, actually, this is my son who's at drama school uh, at the moment, Alex in Manchester, who's wanting to come to Central uh, School. And, uh, and I would sort of, you know, point this, uh, point this out uh, to people. And, um, and then, of course, there was the final, uh, final element. I don't know whether I have it here, but um, uh, when, whenever you kind of had a talk, I haven't got it uh, to hand. But um, they were, uh, there was always the essential <laughs> 20 euros <laughs> as well. And, uh, and often what people would do is uh, and then sort of look very disappointed and, you, know, you might then have to pull out a 50 if you are particularly uh, desperate, depending on which country uh, you were in. But let me tell you my own story. Uh, Tanya was telling you a story about uh, Greek mythology uh, this morning uh, through Thebes, and I walked through Tima, as it's now called in, uh, uh, <clears throat> in Greece on my, on my way. But uh, my story, my journey, and the inspiration for it began in 776 BC. And at that time, there was a king called King Iphitos, and King Iphitos on the Peloponnese was uh, an older man. He'd lost uh, some uh, two of his sons, uh, including his favourite son, who was going to succeed him, uh, to the constant state of war which existed in the city-states between the Spartans and, uh, and, and various other city-states. And uh, and he just, you know, I suppose, coming to the end of his tale, said, "You know, is there anything we can do to stop the perpetual state of war uh, which exists?" on the Peloponnese. And he decided, as was uh, off the case at those times, to go 
uh, as uh, all men would probably do, to consult a female. And this female was the Ark of Delphi. And so he made his way uh, to, uh, to Delphi, uh, which I also visited on the walk, and into the temple there. And uh, he posed this question uh, to the Ark, and the Ark went off and took her vapors and <laughs> Yeah, they waited you know, a few days. And then one of the things which I didn't appreciate about the oracle was that the oracle would never uh, answer a question. Uh, she would always pose a question. Uh, because over the uh, lentil into the, the temple uh, of the oracle were, were the words, know thyself. And the argument was that, that well, I suppose the thinking was that the answer is often within us but we don't really realize it. And the process of pilgrimage and asking and being asked questions can actually unlock an answer that was already there. And she posed this question, um, apologies for the Greek, uh, but uh, she posed the question in, in the following terms, slightly expanded, and it was this. She said, well, your problem is that fighting men can't stop fighting because they're full of fear. And the king looked really puzzled because he was thinking, well, you know, my fighting men are fearless. They are so strong, bold, and certainly not. No, they're full of fear. Not of the enemy. Oh, really? Not of the enemy. No, it's not fear of the enemy. It is fear of appearing weak or losing face to their family and to their friends in their own city state. So they must continue to keep going out to fight people who they don't particularly know uh, and you know, don't particularly have any grievance against simply because they don't want to uh, lose face uh, at, uh, at home. Uh, and we can see how little has changed in that respect <laughs> over 3,000 uh, years. And then she sent uh, them away with this uh, this thought, she said, of course, if you could come up with some way in which fighting men could temporarily lay down their arms without losing face to their supporters, you might have a chance of peace. And when they uh, left and went uh, back, they came with the idea of the games at Olympia, where uh, fighting men could be invited to come to neutral ground. Olympia is common ground, it was the temple of Zeus, uh, it was neutral ground. And they could all come there, and they could do lots of manly things. They could throw spears, they could race chariots, they could wrestle, uh, they could do all the things that would be you know, distinctly manly, uh, and, uh, and yet they wouldn't be killing each other. And then they came up with this gem of an idea, one of the many gems that have come out of and they said, of course, listen, you know, nobody wants to have a truce because, hey, listen, you know, all of us want to go and keep fighting, you know, forever, don't we? Yes, of course, absolutely. Uh, but um, if we want everybody to be able to travel to the games, to this neutral place, uh, it'd be nice if everybody could travel in safety, wouldn't it? Oh, yeah, yeah, of course. Well, so for the games, just for the 16 days of the games, we'll just have a truce. Yeah, yeah, fair enough. So, with honour, they were able to agree to this. So you had a truce, and they, uh, you know, travelled uh, all the uh, from all different parts, and they were invited to camp. But there was one other thing, which was, of course, and in many ways, this was uh, an area where the modern Olympics have completely lost it, the ancient vision. And it was this. They said, well, of course, if we invite, said the king. Everybody could come and compete just without killing each other, you know, as Spartans and Athenians. And, uh, well, that's just going to perpetuate it. <laughs> you know, it's just going to be, you know, we're the best, we're the strongest, you know, you cheated or whatever. So they said, no, you're coming on neutral ground, so you come all as Olympians. And you leave every vestige of your identity at the gate uh, when you come into the temple. Uh, because you're no longer Spartan, you're no longer Athenian, you're no longer Corinthian. Uh, you are Olympian. And what's more, they had to compete naked, said Iran. Uh, <laughs> for which reason, uh, ladies weren't allowed to uh, watch uh, the ancient uh, Olympic uh, Games. And uh, so they had this. Uh, and then, of course, some interesting things started happening. 
So out of this the whole idea in 776 BC, way out on the Peloponnese, uh, first of all you have a truce, you have a period of peace, organized peace, uh, you know, which they hadn't uh, known before. The second thing is, of course, um, if you turn up for a competition, there needs to be some rules. So how are you going to agree the rules? Everybody needs to agree. You can't have one group starting from one point on the track. Everybody needs to start at some point. There needs to be an agreed as to what a chariot is and you know, what, what's allowed in terms of the So they set up a little group with representatives from all of the city-states to agree what the rules should be. So you have this nascent parliament that was there in Olympia way before you know, Westerners there was a sort of twinkle in anybody now. Uh, it was there. And the second thing which they needed to do was they needed to say, well, hang on, yes, but what happens if somebody disagrees? You know, they say, no, no, I'm gone. You know, no, he, he, he cheated, you know, or whatever. Well, so we need to have some people who are beyond reproach, kind of judges, people who can, you know, just oversee that the rules have been applied fairly and, and whatever. So you had the, this whole class of justices and judiciary. And, you know, these ideas, which sound so very uh, strange because they're connected to sport, trickled down through the years, they ran on for 1,200 years, from 776 BC until they were stopped uh, under Constantine, the Roman Empire. Mm -hmm. uh, standing enough because it was, uh, they were deemed pagan mm -hmm. uh, events rather than Christian. Uh, but nonetheless, they went on for, for, for 1,200 years. And those very ideas trickled down, I'm sure, in the consciousness of Plato and Socrates and Aristotle, mm -hmm. and formed a little bit of a basis of saying, you know, how do people uh, you know, conduct themselves and how do we organize ourselves as a society and the idea of the demos and the idea of law and the idea of being uh, agreed rules. And then of course the, the final piece of it was this, uh, is that they um, found that uh, people who were kind of champions, you know, with uh, the olive uh, wreath uh, that was there, they had the olive wreath and they went back to their city-states and these people were heroes. Yo, this is our Olympic champion. And the Olympic champions, every bit as much uh, as today, were celebrated. Of course, they weren't just celebrated in one city state, they were celebrated in all. So you created a kind of diplomatic class, people who could mediate between city states and move freely between cities. These people were, you know, Olympians. You know, they were above politics. And also it meant that people who thought that the only way of getting the prettiest girl in the village uh, was to go out and slaughter 50 men uh, from the neighboring village, uh, actually found another way through sport that they could achieve you know, you know, an appeal, a manliness, and what have you. So I think in lots of ways, it's, it's origin. I just read those stories and uh, heard about them, and they absolutely inspired me and uh, still do. And in many ways, the, the, the ancient games ran for 1,200 years, and, and violations of the truce, the fighting still went on outside the truce, sadly, but violations of the truce were very, very rare. Uh, and they were punished with, uh, with fines, or in the event of a serious breach, which was only one recorded in 212 by the Spartans, they were surprised, uh, that uh, they, were, they were thrown out, but they came back four years later and they didn't reoffend. And you compare that to the modern Olympic Games, which have been going for a tenth of the time, 110 years. They've been cancelled three times because of war. They've been the subject of mass boycotts five times and terrorist attacks twice. And some people might ask what we've actually lost in 3,000 years of civilization, that we kind of practice restraint in the conduct uh, of warfare. And all of these things conspired together to uh, lead me to become sort of quite passionate about this, particularly because the Olympic truce since 1994 has been a resolution of the United Nations General Assembly. And uh, all the countries of the world sign it, and nobody pays a bit of attention <laughs> to it. They just carry on exactly as they were. And it is always proposed by the host nation. And I came up with this, uh, uh, what may seem like a crazy idea, it did seem like a crazy idea to my friends and colleagues uh, in government uh, to say, as Her Majesty's government is going to propose this at the UN General Assembly, it would be nice if we actually implemented it for the first time. 
and in doing so, encourage others to implement it too, to see if we can just have a bit of a uh, connection. Well, all went on, and uh, I'm afraid uh, I completely failed. I give so many speeches, I even tried to change the law to make sure that we had to uh, do it. And there just wasn't any interest uh, at all. Everybody would smile sweetly. They'd say, a lovely idea, my way. Very, very, very nice. So it's completely unworkable. I said, yeah, but it worked 3,000 years ago. Yeah, yes, I know. That was 3,000 years ago. <laughs> yeah, it cannot work now. And, uh, and I just said, sort of got lots of sort of tea and nice smiles. And you know, I couldn't make any headway at all. And, and then two, two events uh, happened over a weekend that were to have a major change uh, on my approach. And uh, the first one was that I learned uh, that, uh, having been told that it was absolutely impossible in the space of 18 months to think of one way to implement the new truce, uh, we, we then, uh, in order to have a military intervention in Libya, uh, managed to, uh, over a weekend, literally over a weekend, <laughs> we managed to have a resolution through the Security Council that was only supported by 10 countries. We put together a budget of 1.5 billion, and we were, you know, uh, bombing in the I sort of tripping, sorry, I don't mean to change trespass on it, but we were, you know, assembled a, an army, a navy, and, you know, we could, we had immense political will. I thought, blimey, you know, if you can do that for something which is signed by 10 nations over a weekend, you've had you've two years to do this, which is signed by 193. You know, why can't we just do it? So, first road to action is first of all, you start getting a bit irritated. And the second thing which broke that same weekend was that they decided, for security reasons, that uh, the only uh, remaining tribute to the Olympic troops, which was the Olympic torch relay, you know, it's torches lit in Olympia and then it's run through all the sort of different countries. And, uh, and they'd announced, uh, uh, LOCOG and the IOC, that because of security concerns following the for the Iranian human rights protesters, uh, and uh, that uh, they were really not going to have it. So they're simply just going to, for the first time in 75 years, we're going to light the torch in Greece, put it on a plane, fly it to Britain. It was going to go around every corner shop in Britain for 74 days and completely miss out uh, going up through the, the Balkans, uh, Europe, which is known great sort of uh, conflict, the battlefields of the uh, First World War. Second World War, front line of the Cold War, uh, completely miss it out and just come. And I thought, bloody yeah, this is great. So, in a mad weekend, you can see where I sort of ended up. I said, well, if they're not going to do it, there's no reason why I can't. <laughs> so, on with a backpack, you know, on the internet, uh, you know, organized myself a, a, a rucksack. Uh, I had no experience of uh, walking uh, uh, before. In fact, my friends, when, they, uh, when I told them about the idea, uh, they said, well, we can only think three problems uh, with the final. I remember Pizza Express, and we stood outside, and, and I, I said, listen, you know, no, just talk amongst yourselves. I need absolute, you know, frank, honest trust on it. And this, I went back in, and they said, well, we've got three problems. First one is, uh, I'm afraid to say, we don't think you're going to make it because you know, you've got a reputation of being the type of guy who takes a taxi to the underground station, <laughs> and that's only to go to Pizza Express. Um, the second thing is, nobody's heard of the Olympic truce. I said, yes, well, that's true. I said, well, what's the third? I said, well, nobody's heard of you. I said, well, yes. Well, but apart from that, without bringing an endorsement in my mind, I, of course, paid due attention to them and, uh, and caught an easy jet flight uh, to, uh, to, to Athens and, uh, and set off uh, by coach uh, for a deserted Olympia and, and set off on Good Friday. And I set off on Good Friday, part because of uh, a faith uh, which I wrestle with from time to time, but uh, it's still there. And uh, uh, I set up on Good Friday for that reason, but also because uh, Good Friday was a truce, which is still holding uh, the Good Friday Agreement in Northern Ireland. And so when people would say to me, of course, truce to you, it's a problem. <laughs> you know, there is one going on. We never thought we'd see peace uh, in Northern Ireland in my lifetime. You know? uh, so you know, that was the uh, argument, and I set up on a walk in walked and where I found it uh, initially exhilarating and then uh, you're know, pretty scared. Uh, you know, I found walking in the cold quite easy, walking in the heat uh, incredibly difficult because I would run out of water and, uh, and that is, uh, so I, I collapsed with dehydration on two occasions. 
and, uh, and was somehow dragged into uh, somebody's front room or a petrol station on one occasion, and someone's front room on the other occasion to, to recover. Uh, I kept going on, and, uh, and I was just quite inspired by the journey. I found it a, an action when I was out there, a very therapeutic experience. You know, as a politician, you see that your life, uh, you can virtually tell what you're going to be doing at this time next year. Uh, your diary is stacked up in the plants, and the fact that you just live your life in the day. So every day I would just get up and I'd look at the map and say, I wonder if I can get to there tonight. Well, that would be fantastic, wouldn't it? So I just had to get to there. It wasn't anything else. It was pointless thinking about the next day until I'd actually had the day. So you live completely in the day. Uh, and all you were thinking about is you, you, know, you want to meet and engage with people because you always wanted information. Were you on the right road? Were you, you know, was there a shorter route to, to, to get to a, a particular place? Was there a place for water? Was there a place for food? So you, you were forced to interact uh, with people. And I just found it uh, an incredible uh, experience. And uh, then to, to kind of close the I've probably gone on too long, but to, to finish the, uh, uh, the story, um, after about six weeks, uh, I arrived in uh, Albania. Oh, well, uh, yes, I arrived in Tirana in, in Albania. And, uh, and I got a telephone call from Dan, speaking of Prime Minister, who was uh, out there, he, obviously indicative of our very close relationship. It took me six weeks to realise that I wasn't actually. And he looked at what on earth are you doing? And I said, I'm walking about this, but I've written to you about 50 times about it, and I have mentioned it to you uh, once. And I said, you know, I'm just saying, you know, you ought to take it seriously. He said, of course we should take it seriously. I said, well, what would you mind sort of saying that uh, publicly? He said, of course it was. So he made a statement in the House of Commons. He said, you know, well, the Olympic truce is a historic opportunity. Overnight, uh, all of a sudden, things started opening up. Uh, the Foreign Office uh, got behind it in a massive way and they started organizing events for when I was passing through each country uh, to mark the Olympic truce. They started working like crazy at the UN to try and get people uh, to, uh, to engage with it. And really, the diplomats did a, a fantastic, uh, uh, job in that, but the whole thing uh, changed uh, changed around. And uh, and one of the things, that, and I'll, I'll finish on the last one when I actually got back, which I often say was about uh, what people say about the media. Uh, and of course, it was very interesting uh, uh, encounters with the media because there was no interest whatsoever uh, in, the, in the war from the media. Not that I was trying particularly hard, because there were only six people: the UN Secretary General. The Foreign Secretary, the Prime Minister, differed, you know, who I needed to persuade, the IOC President, uh, Jack Rock and uh, Seth Cole. So my audience was small that I was trying to persuade on these things. And I arrived back uh, on the shores, and, and uh, very kindly, uh, Seth Cole, uh, William Hague, and David Cameron put out a joint statement, just welcoming back and saying what a great uh, initiative would be. And very famous. And as a result of this, I got a few telephone calls. And the first telephone uh, was from the Daily Telegraph, and they uh, called, and they said, ah, Robert, uh, you've just arrived back, you've walked 2,900 miles? I said, yeah, yeah, I've uh, got another 100 miles to go. I said, well, we've just got uh, one uh, question here. You've been on this walk now for 10 months. Um, could you just tell us uh, how many expenses you've claimed? <laughs> <laughs> uh, I said, uh, oh, no, I don't, yeah. I, I said, well, no, I said, I you know, I said, the House of Lords were only paid if we attend. I said, well, I haven't attended, so I haven't claimed anything. He said, what? Well, nothing. So how did you fund it? I, I said, I just did it myself. You know, I said, I just had a budget of 15,000 uh, pounds. It was 50, 50 pounds a day, 30 pounds for accommodation, 20 pounds for food. Uh, and I said, I've just tried to work to that budget all the way through. All right, so you haven't claimed anything? Uh, no, 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 because I haven't been there. So <laughs> that's it. All right, okay, but that's well, well done anyway. And then, <laughs> 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 the last I heard of it. And, uh, and then the, uh, the, the, the second one uh, from uh, 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 not a, a national newspaper, it was actually from the, the north of England. Uh, and then he said, uh, I've just seen this press notice. It was very interesting. He said, um, and he, says, um, he said, I can't believe that you've walked all this way. He said, Have you really? He said, D Did you get any kind of, you, know, you must have taken a lift at some point, or you must have kind of, you know, when it got a bit so hard going or something like that. And, uh, and I said, uh, yes, I did. I mean, 
hear this all delight, you know, you know break the scoop. I said, yes, I said, when I, when I fell in the Alps and broke my arm and dislocated my shoulder, uh, I said, it is true to say that I did actually have to get moved <laughs> to the hospital, the accident emergency. I said, but I did then get a lift back to the place where I had the accident and continued walking two years, two days later. Ah, oh. I said, all right, okay. Uh, yeah, but, uh, you know, have you got any proof of this? I said, well, actually, I said, uh, I've uh, I said all the way along, I said, being slightly uh, aware that people might question, I said, not necessarily you, the good press, I said, but my, knew that they were questioning it. What I did is I set up a website where I had a camera, a Lumix camera, uh, with a GPS satellite navigator on it. And every five kilometers, I took a photo of myself like this. I said, so on my website, I said, if you go to my website, walk for two stars. I said, on there, you will see 1,400 photographs uh, that were taken at various points. I said, so, and what they do is they upload them onto a map so you can see where I've kind of traveled through. Oh. And I said, also, I said, there's 300 blogs sort of, you know, telling people that I sort of met. And, and I said, also, I said, if you're still down there, so I've still got 120 miles to go, so you can come down and join me in Dover <laughs> <laughs> for, for the last time. I know that's fine. And then the final one was from the BBC, and they, they rang up to say, so, um, great, just seen this old notes, welcome back. Um, uh, have you got any celebrities walking with you? Uh, I said, no, no, I said, I'm just on my own. I said, well, you haven't got a backup for you? I said, no, 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 I said, I'm just on my own. I just kind of sort of trying to find places to stop on the way. I said, well, you haven't got any celebrities? Do you have, like, any, is anybody kind of coming out? Like Joanna Longley or Bono or someone like that? Or Angelina Jolie? I said, Angelina Jolie's coming out. I said, no, I'm asking you, have you got Angelina Jolie? <laughs> said, no, no, I said, I haven't got anybody. And uh, he said, well, you know, how are you going to draw attention? I said, well, I'm going to let it. But if you find any, they're more than welcome to come and join me uh, you know, at any point on it. So, oh, right, okay. So, well, if it suddenly does turn up, do give us a shout. We might come for it, you know. When it, you know. And I thought, in a sense, when I arrived back, it was a wonderful sort of journey between this heavy idealism. But it almost led me to this place, because when I was in Athens, uh, they reminded me that, that when they elected their politicians, they said it was absolutely essential that they had satirists uh, and they had theatre as a way of parodying them and mocking them. And the words which they said were to make sure that we stop, keep their feet in the city and stop them to ascending to the mountains with the God, to be with the gods. And <coughs> then actually, God bless the British press, because they do just that uh, uh, through it. So I felt as if I'd, uh, I'd done this journey. I've probably talked too long. I am sorry about that, but wonderful to be with you. Lovely. Thank you okay. very much. Now we have a direct report. Whoa. So, first of all, thank you very much for coming. We're a remnant, but actually there's lots more of us that don't bother to come to a business meeting and who are doing the work and may not see the importance of this afternoon, which is and is not important. This is the gathering of the hub of something which is way beyond uh, charity commission rules. And yet, thank you for coming and making the time. So, just about the, the membership thing. It may feel cruel and difficult, and yet what Sesame is trying to do is have a professional attitude for soul values, which includes something about having the right bits of paper in the right places at the right time. And we're really trying to push this and maintain it and keep it clean. Because so often we can be this kind organization that can lean this way and that way and that way and this way and make exceptions. And we compromise something of value by not having a straight line. So I ask you to take that, digest it, spit it out, vomit it, whatever you need to do with it, but just at least hear it. So, I'd like to talk a little bit about the Sesame <coughs> Institute because we are a charity. So often people come here wanting something and, and I think the charity itself wants something from you. 
and there's been a kind of compromise of understanding about who is giving to who. So the Sesame Institute, according to the Charities Commission, is a registered charity that is in business to promote mental health, and this is their, our defined uh, reason for being, promote mental health and well-being by the therapeutic use of drama and movement and the imagination. We educate health professionals in this way of working, namely the Sesame approach, by delivering training courses, promoting research, and liaising between <coughs> therapist and service users. So I'm going to try and make my report to you under these three headings of education through training, research, and therapist liaison membership. The training is delivered, this is a really important point, the training is delivered to people who work with people. We're not working with frontline clients, people with needs. You, if you like, are our clients because we are enabling your practice to work with other people and this makes us a second tier charity. We're not like Roundabout who works out there with people who need. We are trying to enable the people who help the people in need. And it makes us dodgy. We're not as cute, maybe. We don't have, we can't show photographs of people in need. We can show photographs of the people who help the people in need. And that's not as easy to sell by. So, wanted to put that as part of our dilemma. <coughs> To give a context to the work of the year, I want to remind you that staff of the Sesame Institute are Christine Hanfrey, the administrator, on two days a week. Becky Macionis as assisting director, one day a week. Esther as fundraiser, money bringer in, one day a week. And me as director, three days a week. This is what we have accomplished, so a lot of it's done for a financial return, and a lot of it's done for charity, for love. So first of all, delivery of training since the last AGM. We have done two visits with Gillian Downey to Swansea University, to the applied drama students, along with university counsellors. So we had young people uh, doing their applied drama course with the counsellors in the university, because we're drama and we're therapy. We met 25 people on that occasion. We've run three London, dr London Drama Movement Therapy introduction courses in London. 30 people came to those. We have an ongoing liaison with the Drama Movement Therapy Sesame Master's Course at Central School of Speech and Drama. And that happens through monthly meetings, two monthly meetings between <coughs> Richard Hoffman, the course leader, and myself. I deliver three Sesame in Context uh, modules on the course. I participate in interview and Viva procedures. And I am also collaborating with Richard Hoffman to supervise our PhD candidate, Charlotte Gibbons, who's just completing her degree. So about 21 people are met through that. There's been one visit to Brunel University to apply drama therapy to drama students quite a small group of people, six people. We've delivered and completed the two-year training Psyche in Soma. That's for psychotherapists or clergy people or social workers or teachers who want to come to bring to their existing uh, procedure something of the drama and movement therapy places that we bring. And there were six people, sorry, seven people uh, moved through that. We've done one open sesame taster at the Centre for Counselling and Psychotherapy Training, 12 people attended. We've done a three-day CPD event for professionals in Cork, in Ireland, with six people. We've recruited for the next Psyche and Soma training, starting in December of this year. We've also had the Stepping Stones Professional Conference, thanks to Helen and Alicia, and with 40 people attended that. And there's also another professional development training starting called Open Sesame at the Centre for Counselling and Psychotherapy. So in the last year, on these kind of like part-time work, 
We have trained 153 professionals who are outreaching to people with client groups, which I think is quite a, a good achievement. So moving on to research, what we're doing in research since the last AGM. You've had this in your report pack, but to repeat it and just bring it back to you, because it's worth saying. Over the last year, uh, research has taken place in many ways in the Sesame Institute. We've done quarterly Wednesday evening research gatherings. This is for people in the Sesame community who are interested to write or to research, but think they're not worth it. There's such a big status about research. And actually, writing about something that matters, being able to talk about it with authority, is common ground and should be the heritage of anyone who has a training and expertise in practicing with people. So we're trying to make it user-friendly. So we've had four inputs in 2012. Fish out of water with our own doctor, arguing for psyche and sesame in academia. We had 20 people came to that. We had sesame and developmental transformation with Dr. David Reed Johnson, a big evening up at Central School of Speech and Drama, where we likened and compared what David Reed Johnson does in his approach and through the sesame approach. We welcomed Professor Robin Nelson from Central, looking at what it is to be a professional practitioner to into a practitioner, someone who works with people and research. And 11 people came to that. And then we had a gathering of our own folk uh, who had attended research evenings, harvesting the homegrown, which were Lane Ambrose and Kath Butler presented at. And we are excited to say that these evenings are now being filmed and placed on YouTube, thanks to our Jackie, Miss Sparks here, um, so that Sesame International, people in other countries, can come in and be part of those evenings. The other thing that we've uh, been looking at, there's an online Google group, and there's about 35 people on that group. Most of them are really silent. <laughs> they watch in and they listen in because they think they're not good enough to be part of research. And what we've been playing with rather uh, mysteriously in the last four or five months is the idea of let's play, let's pretend we're researchers. So we wrote a story to kind of metaphor the difficulties we have with research. And this came in from countries all around the world. We had bits coming in through, thanks to Google, from Australia, from Greece, from India, from Norway, and the home ground here. And together, we wrote a story of the difficulties of research. And we're still playing with that, and I think we might even try an attempt at publication at some point, or a Sesame Evening Research, to prove what something of international research and metaphor can bring back to this hardline thing of prove yourself. We're, we're, that's work in action. But to say, that's out there, and please do join the Google group, even if you're a silent observer. We'll lure you in somehow. We've also had an ancient uh, legacy from Terpsichore re research a long time ago. We had four researchers out there uh, doing some academic research. The only one that's really surviving is this woman here. <laughs> just about as well. I've got herself into a journal. It's taken heaven and earth to move. Is it really worth it? Not sure. Is it really worth it? It's been worth it to work with Susie Thornton. <laughs> <laughs> So whatever else happens, yes, that, that was, has been worth it. But, it. but it is submitted for what we seriously hope is the last time on, on Monday. Excellent. And uh, I am here to tell the tale. And it's a struggle. <laughs> it's a struggle to comply to the knitting patterns of academia. Uh, our, you know, it brings up big questions about are we in the right model? Is the medical model, is the scientific model, the right model for us, don't know, but we need to adhere to how uh, something that has been alive and organic and visible has to be shrunk down into something else and 
both are needed. I'm holding this PhD in my hand still. Um, PhDs, okay. <laughs> Just to say we've had this in our hot little hands. It doesn't belong to me. But this is Dr. Tata's uh, wonderful research. <laughs> Have you got a breath there to speak? Yeah, no. <laughs> I've been uh, through, this was my second round today. <laughs> I have to start getting used to it, this the graduation ceremony in two weeks. Yes, yes, yeah. Mm -hmm. So she's a doctor really, but she hasn't graduated. Mm -hmm. and we're lucky to have her in her raw style. But just to say that that uh, is a very important thing, because it's someone who's managed to juggle her way through, to move her way through both using body, to using acting, to using her therapy, her sesame bit, and brings through something that's both in film and in a very firm and heavy document mm -hmm. that uh, marks the spot. And we've also got Charlotte Gibbons, who's coming up to submitting her uh, research, her PhD to, and Alison Coleman, and others. So there's a culture of being able to find our way through these patterns. And in fact, that lady there has done her own bit, indeed, decade on. So, uh, just to say thanks and, and an appreciation of these people. Um, but th still talking about research, Badfa and Sesame are trying to streamline. We've had a legacy of being one there and one there, and it's outgrown and outmoded. We're working in a very small community of the arts has been healing, and Bruce Bailey of Badfa and I meet about once every two months just to see how we, Sesame and Badfa, can work together. And what we've been doing over the last two years is running a day that is hosted by both organisations in research. And this year, Tanya again and Alison Coleman were the Sesame reps who represented uh, Sesame at that. I think the last thing I would like to say about research, and this is a, I'd like you to listen into this because it's a kind of turn of what we're doing with Sesame. In 2011, we were offered a grant from Holy Trinity Church in Wimbledon. We applied for it and we were accepted through quite uh, hermetical conditions. But I'd like to read you our application which read, because this was a turning point for Sesame, and it's been the root of our fundraising procedure that Esther's following through. So we asked this church, that had the big grant made to it, for this. We told them this about ourselves. We teach a way of working therapeutically called the Sesame Approach, which is life-enhancing. It honours soul values, and it's needed in today's world. <coughs> we cannot give this because we are dependent on income from the very people who come to us for training. They wish to access our courses and our therapy delivery, but they don't have funds. Because we have no income stream, the Institute is living on what remains of a legacy, so it's increasingly difficult to fulfill our charitable aim. We want to be able to teach carers, teachers, clergy, therapists, and anyone working in the helping professions so that they in turn can work better with people in difficulty. As a rule, funding is designated to the fast actualities of quantitative results. Outcomes of Sesame are more often qualitatively assessed. Over years, people experiencing the Sesame approach report what they describe as coming home to themselves. They find an ability to meet life demands differently because they have discovered a strong sense of confidence and inner support through working imaginatively. We ask you to help us, and this is the word that we're framing our future on, to gift Sesame, to give it away as a charity should. And from this grant from Holy Trinity a Church, we were offered funds to invite people to attend our introduction trainings 
And as a result, we were able to offer seven free bursary places. And we had 17 applicants for that. They were psychotherapists, social workers, teachers, and NHS staff. We asked them to come, participate freely on one of our events, and then to complete a simple research form. They had to write a small piece on their Sesame learning experience and a short report on how they have used what they had met in three days back to servicing their clients. We're presently going through that data, because we've just finished doing that about three or four weeks ago, and the data that comes back so that we can gift Sesame and explore from what they've said how we develop our fundraising. And we'll be coming a bit more to that in, in, the, few, in the moment. So that's the research part, and it's been quite thick and, and important. And then professional membership. And just as I said before, I want to thank Sesame people and others who support the charity for their ongoing membership. It costs a lot to you, and it's really important. And yet it's a very, very small part of the expenses of the charity. The running costs of the Institute are not anywhere near covered by the income from our memberships. And one of the things we have to look at as our legacy that we were given runs out, how we are going to be able to make changes. We are certainly going to have to bring staff members right down. There may be things like the journal, which is in a hard copy now and beautiful, a thing of beauty, but may have to go into that invisible place of online. We're, if we're going to continue in any shape or form, we're going to shape shift and look differently. And we may be calling on charity more than finance, and that certainly, uh, for the staff, is going to have big implications. But what we've been trying to provide to you in the generosity of the legacy is three journals in the last year. We've been, uh, had three journals going out, one on the theme of Sesame International, which Vicky Hoffman has uh, brought to us. We had Richard Davis, our main editor, uh, writing on Pat Watts and James Hillman, our two deceased and moved on, on honouring the gods. And our most recent one, Rula Dimitro in Cyprus, on exile. We've been continuing to offer a mentoring scheme for people, new graduates from the course, to be linked up to somebody who's got a lot of experience and have a free friendship, both ways. Uh, we've also updated, as we promised you we would, our membership page. It's in new development, but on the web page we now have... Is Tanya leaving? I have. I'm working at Stratford. So. <laughs> <laughs> oh, <I'm> so. <laughs> also, I'm so excited to present Tanya. I may send you back in, but I guess... A little bit of Dionysian, thank you. Oh, thank you. <laughs> well, I should better keep it for later because I'm working with children, so I should not go <laughs> Thank you. Sorry that I have to escape. And thank you for uh, coming and all your feedback today. Thank you. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you. We've also had these gorgeous t-shirts made that prove that we're <laughs> all the way from Greece. <laughs> <laughs> and the other, thing that's, <laughs> the other thing that's importantly happened is that students from Central are coming much more down to the office to look at the archives, which are now in place thanks to Becky and Christine who have bent their little heads going through Billy's notes of ancient days and trying to make sense of them and string them into some logos. So, uh, very well done. Funding. Okay, so we're really flagging up. I was delighted to hear that you thought it was 2015, 2016, because of my consultations. I thought it was 2014, we're closing, and actually I'd rather trust my sources than yours. But, we're but I'm working on the basis that we've slimmed down on the way there, okay. so it sort of moves us out a bit. Okay. So Sesame, in, its, in what you've been used to, you know, turning up maybe to uh, AGM, 
Mary being in place, other people being around, workshops through the year, is going to change unless something magical happens. And we're trying to hold together this idea of something important happening through the fundraising team that we've got and the very, reality, the very real thing of the big monies running out. Something will exist that there are going to be big changes and needing to flag that up to you so you understand and it doesn't come as a shock. We really want to keep with this idea of giving it away because Billy's dream came to her as something that the world needed and the government is rolling out at the minute statements about well-being and a need for well-being. And well-being is something that people need, and it's, it's as we know, very close. It's, it's a, it, it isn't about pathology and labelling. It's a quick step into people finding their creativity. And we know how to do that. But we don't know how to tell others that we know how to do it, and they don't get what we're talking about because they can't come and do it. So we've got a dilemma of how to communicate that and how to bridge that place that we're in. So we want to, our idea is that if we can give this to people, if we can take this into institutions where we can find there's a need and say, come and partake of a sesame workshop, have a day, have a three day, have a week doing sesame. We know sesame sells itself. As soon as people are in there, they know. And so what we need is funding to help us to be able to continue to do that in some shape or form. We're working very hard and we've got a unique combination that is our saviour. We've never had this before. It's really important to hear this. Uh, often we've been challenged, what are you doing about fundraising? We, have, we had been doing so much but it's been very difficult to raise because we're a second-tier charity. We have a unique team on board of special people. We have Becky's husband, John Macionis, who is in banking and understands finance. And we have Esther, who is a Sesame practitioner with a different slant. And the combination of these two have been able to enroll for the first time, the kingdoms of finance, with the sesame approach, not floating a ship and scarf for once, but actually hard hitting into saying, this is who we are. And in this last year, she has brought in to about 25,000 pounds, which is off the record, nobody has brought this in before. It's really hard. <laughs> For Esther and John Magionis, and uh, also to thank the Waits Foundation, who have actually sponsored uh, Esther again for another year. So I think thank you so much, mm -hmm. real investment in that. So just to close, future aims. What are we doing in 2014 apart from trying to blooming well continue? That's the main thing. We're trying to 2013. Yeah, I forgot. 2013. <laughs> <laughs> 2013. Okay, so we're maintaining everything we've done. We are really wanting to live on. There's a book coming out which I really want to just flag up to you. Um, some of the stories that Pat Watts, before she died, uh, reconciled as being important for Sesame, Jenny Pearson managed to get them down. And Jenny and Pat and I are publishing a book coming out in May called The Golden Stories of Sesame as a means of putting that in place. So that feels like a really important holding of the old and honouring of something of the, the tradition. I think we also are hoping to uh, run the continual events that we do. Psyche and Soma is starting again in, 20, in December of this year. And we're really considering, can we do that each year? We've had quite a few applicants who were sending away. 
beginning to think what would be the cost and the, the, the possibilities of that be. So thanks to our story elder who will not be lit up, Pat Watts. <laughs> want to thank the teaching teams of Psyche and Soma and Central School of Speech and Drama who bring the two courses who work at a very <coughs> low financial return. No money, hardly any money for what they do. Want to thank the Sesame Institute Council who turn up to meetings every six weeks, to Kath Butler, the chair, Esther, the vice chair, our treasurer, Becky Macionis, Louise Crooms, Alicia Harris, and Richie, and for the people who come on as representatives, and Louise, our new Sesame rep from the full-time training. And to say to the executive team, to Chris Hanfrey, our administrator, Liz Holder, our subscription person, Tim Spears, our bookkeeper, fundraiser, Becky, and assistant director, and to the dreaming of Sesame underneath. And I'd like to finish with just a quote from John Donoghue about the soul that desires expression. The human person deeply desires expression. One of the most beautiful ways the soul is present is through thought. Thoughts are the form of the soul's inner swiftness. In a certain sense, there is nothing in the world as swift as a thought. It can fly anywhere and be with anyone. Our feelings too can move swiftly, yet even though they are precious to our own identity, thoughts and feelings still remain invisible. In order to feel real, we need to bring that inner, invisible world to expression. Every life needs the possibility of expression. When we perform an action, the invisible within us finds a form and comes expression. Therefore, our work should be the place where the soul can enjoy becoming visible and present. So let it be, each in our own way. Thank you.
there might be another whole massive amount of staff team that will you know give something um, at another time and I think the just for me just giving is also changing the thoughts of of the fact that we are a charity. I know we've really heard that today a lot already, but just the fact that, it, you know, Sesame is on the same realms, albeit much further down, as the likes of Mind or Mencap. You see constant campaigns for these charities. And, you know, about please donate here, donate there, do a sponsored run for this, bake some cakes for this. You know, this is what we need to kind of get into the realms of doing. And I've done two sponsored runs for Sesame. I don't know if I can do that more. <laughs> I'm not suggesting we go by your standards that, you know, I'm as inspiring as it is. But, yeah. <laughs> but certainly, you know, ah, oh, yes, I would quite like to bake some cakes for my local Christmas fair and donate the money to Sesame. That's the kind of thing that I'm really asking the membership to share the news about, not necessarily the passionate few that have collected today, but for everybody just to say that that's the kind of realms that I need the membership's help on. I can keep churning the big applications over, but as far as the just giving goes, I can't do that by myself. I've, I've donated a pound to make sure it was working, but I can't do <laughs> which it does. I was very excited when I received that text message. Thank you for donating to the Sesame Institute. But mainly, you know, this, for me, that's the main thing that I wanted to be really clear on today, this just giving thing really changing our thoughts on we are a charity, we need to raise money, you know, if you really fancy climbing count, you know, Mount Kilimanjaro next year, do it for Sesame, you know, whatever you would, however you would like to do that, or spread the news, or however, you know, you would like to let other people know about it. So lastly, um, uh, also I would like to start a fundraising working now in that, I'm just looking for two volunteers, very exciting opportunity, because those two volunteers, I would, I mean, I'm going to work out a little bit more about exactly how that would work, Mary and I are going to discuss um, and set the job description for that, and for those people that would be involved in that, but essentially it would give something back to them as well, so that I would probably spend with them an hour, say a month, but it, on supporting them on any fundraising they may be doing for their own work, so there would be something that I would be able to give back to them. I, you know, I've, I've only got so many hours, but that's something that I, that I can do and I can give, and I hope that I've sort of developed enough knowledge, at least over a year of being a fundraiser, that that would be useful to someone. So also you'll find, if you would like to tick any of the boxes, it's not obligatory to tick any one of them, but you, you could tick all of them if you like, and just leave your name and address at the bottom, um, and then just leave it on the table um, before you go out, that would be fantastic. to stand on and move on or hop on, but certainly I feel very uh, inspired again by being reminded of old things and being advised about new things I haven't thought about. So I want to thank very much everybody who has contributed to today. But perhaps most importantly, and I have to speak very loudly, don't I, Billy? You do, yes. <laughs> Diction above all. Diction above all, think Julie Andrews. Um, we have here Billy, the founder of Sesame, and let's make her. <laughs> Church. 
something, and I actually stopped you and said, hold on, that's Olympus quote. You oh, said, <laughs> you said, it's like sesame enfolds you, whatever it is. Mm. I just that. You did say it. <laughs> <laughs> so we took this quote, the sesame enfolds you business, and it's gone out to sesame international people, who have taken this up and finished the sentence, sesame enfold you because, yeah. or when, or in. And Becky and I, very loudly, oh, what? Okay. <laughs> we don't know yet, you're going to hear yes. the way other people... <laughs> <laughs> it was a <laughs> So we're just going to share some of these reflections Finishing your sentence. Yeah, I'm following the plot. Thank you. <laughs> so, Becky, now we'll read these loudly. Forgive us if the writing was a bit strange. I don't know if that's half or not. Right. If you'd like to start loudly. Take a deep breath. <laughs> Sesame enfolds you because it reaches and moves the petals of the inner ocean. Sesame enfolds you into your true self. Sesame enfolds you in embodied imagination that balances and harmonizes the soul. That's a Mary Smale phrase. <laughs> Sesame enfolds you because it gives you an imaginal world in which you can see and be seen. Sesame enfolds you when you open up with a loving heart. Sesame enfolds you because it sees you and allows you to be seen and to feel. Sesame enfolds you because it makes a home for your soul. And from Thessalonica, Sesame enfolds you because it makes me at home. <coughs> Sesame enfolds you whenever and wherever I am. Sesame enfolds you because the approach is helping me in connecting the inner and the outer work in relation to lots of people. Sesame enfolds you in <coughs> soulfulness and play. From South Africa, Tammy Gordon. Sesame enfolds you with a fingerprint you can carry with you wherever you go. That's nice. Sesame enfolds you when the work world seems to hold no respect. And from Jill Wheeler Borden in New Zealand. Sesame enfolds you to open your heart to yourself. Nice. Sesame enfolds you when it's cold outside and the view can be bleak. And it enfolds you with its warmth. And from Eddie Yu in Hong Kong, China. Sesame enfolds my authenticity so that I can always be myself. Is that the one who's in the car? No. From Wai Ying in Singapore. Sesame enfolds life as it gives me the strength to keep on dreaming. Thank you, Bill. I'm from Rula in Cyprus. Sesame enfolds you like an old friend, welcoming you in from the cold. Sesame enfolds you because it opens you up to see the treasure inside. And from Amanda Cross in Australia, Sesame enfolds you whether you like it or not. <laughs> Sesame is restless. Sesame is a force that wants you to play or else. Life in Fold Sesame, reminding us of the importance of living, playing and dreaming, 
and then we do the hokey pokey. <laughs> when she takes you by surprise, yet again, <coughs> and makes everything valuable. And from Lana Suzman in Sydney, Australia, Sesame enfolds you like a cocooning cape, accompanying your magical journey that begins but ends in forever. And lastly, from Anna Taylor in South Korea, Sesame enfolds you as you fold and unfold. We've done some of them today. And where's Jackie? Okay, and Jackie from South Africa mm -hmm. is Sesame International, and she asked people to send these to celebrate you today. Well, I did. And then lastly, what can we say, Elizabeth? Would you present the bouquet to Billy? <laughs> in the circle for your own work. And then just feel the work world behind you coming back and go enjoy Saturday evening. <laughs> <laughs> 